Nintendo's pilot wings for the Super NES, first introduced in Japan near the ass end of 1990 for the Super Famicom, not long following the native console's official launch, more than half a year later here in the US, and finally in Europe the very next year. Now, despite being a Sega addict myself, when this and all the other SNES titles were all the rage during that time period, in full honesty, I've never been really neck deep into the franchise myself until at least two decades ago via emulation training before acquiring the actual cart sometime in 2011. Also, don't think for one goddamn millisecond I've been missing out on much by then either. Premise-wise, you as the student are a member of the world-renowned Flight Club, whose training areas and missions involve grueling aerial sport maneuvers and require 100% conviction, effort, precision, and the like in order to earn your license. Eventually, there's an intense gun call rescue mission that takes place following these training sessions where your instructors are taken hostage and whose ultimate fate lies in your capable hands and undeniable skills alone. Gameplay-wise, you think this is just your average, everyday, run-of-the-mill flight simulator? I'm looking at you, F-22 Interceptor, LHX Attack Chopper, and I'm especially glaring straight at you, Wing Commander, by the already defunct Origin Systems, now in EA's hands. Guess the motherfucking walrus taking Christ again! Upon starting, we're introduced to the first of the Flight Club's four instructors, Tony, originally Fumiya Tanaka, and the two aerial activities you're obligated to engage in. Skydiving, where you're tasked with making a straight nosedive from the air while maneuvering through three rings via the D-pad, and more in later variations of the same lesson. Afterwards, you're then prompted to open your parachute via A at the required altitude of 1,000 feet, and aiming for one of the flashing target areas to land on while avoiding other out-of-bounds patches of land or bodies of water. And the light plane, where you're commandeering said plane along the green dot trail while maintaining your speed with B and or A, and without deviating from it, with later variations involving flying through dot-formed rings before reaching the runway. And most importantly, when landing on the runway, not only do you have to be facing it straight, you have to push B right on target to break, while also maintaining its position at the end. In terms of scoring and the required qualifications for both activities, traversing through one of the rings awards you 5 points, 10 for 2 and 20 for all 3, plus 10 for the diver's overall diving speed and an additional 70 or less for his accuracy, and during the light plane maneuvering exercise, maintaining its beam and angle dead on will award you both 10 and 20 points respectively, plus 20 or less for time and another 50 for accuracy, but an average total of 60 points are necessary to progress. Anything below will result in negative expressions and criticism from your current instructors. Therefore, whatever happens, nail every exercise as best as possible, and don't fuck them over, period! Upon completion of the two introductory exercises, you're then awarded an International License of Certification, in this particular case A-Class, complete with, get this, a six-digit code, which by the way is your password in case you want to continue, likewise for the B-Class Gold and Silver for later, provided on the bottom.
Following that, three more instructors are introduced. Shirley, originally Ron Shiraishi, with the addition of the Rocket Belt, aka the Rocket Pack, according to many, involving hovering through three rings or high bar shaped beams in a later variation, before landing on the target areas with the use of the slow jets and fast jets, activated via B and A individually, and occasionally shifting the view of your trainee via L and or R, while avoiding to land randomly before reaching the third and last ring and or high pillar, which will result in an unexpected two point deduction. Lance, originally Indy Scott, with the inclusion of the hang glider, in which a trainee flies toward the thermal current to as high as 500 feet before landing, while performing necessary quick turns and or flaring. Finally, the often dreaded Big Al, originally Dobe Kuroda, with the overall intent of recertifying your overall skills in these same four maneuvering exercises before the final epic ultimate challenge. Should you happen to fuck up once during any of these reevaluation sessions, you're left with no other goddamn recourse but to start all the way back from square one, likewise for, oh, I don't know, all the previous curriculums. As mentioned before, the scoring system, requirements, and stipulations also apply regarding the rocket belt and hang glider exercises, in said cases, 100 with an additional 20 or less for completing the former in 2 minutes or less, and an additional 30 or less for completing the latter in that very same time frame. On certain occasions, depending on your progress, bonus chances are unlocked, where you control numerous animals and rack up more points by either hopping on the P-mats between trampolines and flying through the pool until reaching the desired distance of your final total as a winged stuntman or diving into the score-appropriated pool as the penguin while avoiding the ground. Upon the final re-evaluation of your progress, thanks to Big Al, aka Dobe, you're then briefed by him that all of the other instructors have been taken hostage by an insidious shadowy syndicate alongside a VIP in connection with Big Al himself. Hence where that previously hinted, quote-unquote, gunko rescue mission is involved. You're then sent off to infiltrate the Syndicate's HQ aboard the Flight Club's attack helicopter, akin to Sega's Thunderblade, Dan Gorland's Choplifter, and even EA's Strike franchise, Desert, Jungle, Urban, Soviet, and Nuclear, taking out as much of the ground turrets while avoiding any and all opposing gunfire, and finally transporting the aforementioned instructors turned hostages, complete with the highest commendation speech anyone's ever accepted, let alone tolerated, followed by a rather satisfying outcome. As most of you can probably tell, while the gameplay features of the overall flight maneuvering exercises, in conjunction with the control framework, are straightforward and on the up and up for the most part, the latter described facet can get rather awkward and discombobulated as fuck, particularly during the more difficult variations of the skydiving and light plane exercises. In terms of aligning your diver as he maneuvers through all of the rings before opening his parachute, not to mention aiming for the final scoring areas, and don't get me started for fuck's sake, with lining up the biplane with a trail of dots and maintaining your altitude, especially while attempting to break while landing at the end. There were barely any difficulties that arose whatsoever regarding the rocket belt and hang glider and or their respective curriculums, which pretty much boils down to the crucial, unabated demand for performance accuracy in these maneuvering sessions. But then again, who the hell am I to incessantly and uncontrollably bitch about anything? Am I right?
Either way, after improving over time, depending on how one's patience is well managed, everything I've laid down thus far should be tolerable and comprehensive, in spite of the varying, albeit protracted learning curves between the maneuvering lessons. Ditto for the rescue mission finale. Not gonna fucking lie there, oh shit no. Regarding Pilot Wing's challenge, consider this our keyword for what we're experiencing here. Cause if you're expecting a leisure vacation out of this simulator, have I got an epic ass newsflash for everyone. You've come to the wrong goddamn soap dropping, salad tossing, mountain lying, 69ing, triceratops teabagging place! And while we're at it, not to turn into a broken-ass analog record regarding the importance of aiming for and ascertaining the best possible results in achieving each and every exercise, but for the skydiving and light plane maneuvers, applying the best judgment is crucial in terms of targeting your diver to land within the flashing areas and or the moving extra platform, cause you'd be in the deepest shit imaginable should you happen to land outside said boundaries. Likewise, if you crash land without engaging the parachute, not to mention the fucking probability of an accidental biplane crash during the latter indicated exercise, should your altitude and or speed turn out to be inconsistent with the final procedure of landing, hovering too high and or running out of fuel during the rocket belt session, missing a single target, including the multicolored trails, rings, and pillars formed by dots or the thermal currents, resulting in massive time consumption due to taking countless laps to compensate for the aforementioned setbacks in all maneuvers including the hang glider, or even worse, being mercilessly shot down by the enemy syndicate ground turrets if your accuracy happens to shit the bed at any given time, which goddammit it will. If all of these don't guarantee that this game will rip off your testicles and hand them right back to you while vomiting nonstop all over your motherfucking backyard and raping your stepsister, especially on Expert, accessed after completing the helicopter rescue finale, I don't know what the Christ else will. All suspenseful, savage, spine-tingling cautionary suggestions aside, you're provided infinite retries because you happen to deliberately fuck up in any of these disciplinary missions, thereby providing yourself the opportunity to further improve your overall navigation skills, strategies, and accuracy in said missions. And if I were you, I'd refer to what's been alluded to regarding the six-digit password system upon receiving every certification license, likewise in the aforementioned expert mode, where all the same sessions are set during the evening and when the shit truly hits the fan in a way no one's ever imagined. Graphically, for yet another acclaimed, albeit slightly overshadowed early launch title during the infancy of its rightful console, the presentation never disappoints a single solitary iota whatso motherfucking ever. The unique expressions of the four instructors are varied, depending on not only their initial introductions, but also the user's overall skill and progress in terms of accomplishing every task, taking said accomplishments miles far beyond the instructor's expectations, or just fucking flat out failing big time, resulting in either ecstatic, shocked beyond belief, and or in waterworks mode, you know, emotional, tearful, crying a river, that kind of shit, in Big Al's case at least, and or extremely deathly concerned or pissed off reactions, with the extreme latter being the most common every time your capabilities go down the shitter in record time. The instrumental details displayed at the top, the radar, angle and rotation display, speedometer, altitude gauge, and the timer and fuel meter were all necessarily arranged for users to keep track of said details, and the biplane and helicopter in which you travel, and the student trainee, depending on the activity he participates in, outside of the former two vehicles, are nothing short of respectable either, likewise for the appropriate color hues, especially depending on the daytime setting, and or nighttime setting that is. Also, how can anyone go wrong with the always slotted Mode 7 graphical manipulation techniques for the scaling and rotation of the background layers and participating images used in countless other Super NES titles throughout the console's lifespan, whose distinctive names and legacies should jog everyone's memory and won't be mentioned in any form whatsoever except for this short montage displayed here? <laughs>
It's all thanks to a special chip that was applied to the game's internal workings, the DSP-1, or the Digital Signal Processor. And also, fun fact, it was introduced as a tech demo to the Japanese press at various shows and conventions under the alternative title of Dragonfly, exhibiting the aforementioned Mode 7. In summation, with all the randomized technical jargon aside, even after more than three decades, the immersive, near-futuristic, and infinitely engaging flight simulation experience has been nothing short of a wondrous sight to behold, not to be taken for granted, thanks to every innovative graphical facet laid down thus far, and then some. The music and sound department, orchestrated by a pre Super Mario Kart Soyo Oka, also known for Ice Hockey, Versus Excite Bike, Sim City, out the same year as this shit, Super Mario All Stars, and even Wario's Woods before leaving Nintendo and providing pre composed music for other projects, including various anime and commercials, under the distinctive pseudonym of DJ Alice, in collaboration with the always prolific Koji Kondo. And for more information on the latter, refer to my Zelda Thon review from Season 4, Number 40. The majority of the songs kick way too much ass, despite being more on the ethereal, uncluttered, and laid-back side, in terms of capturing the overall vibe of the game's Flight Club world. At least the helicopter theme, composed by Kondo himself, possesses this tense, anti-bullshit despondency, while the accomplished student-trainee-turned-pilot approaches and infiltrates the opposing syndicate and its relentless-as-fuck weaponized threats, as opposed to all the other tracks, including but strictly not limited to the appropriate end-of-lesson jingles, plus the instructor feedback and encouragement themes, depending on your overall skill and results. The realistic, engaging sound effects, also engineered by Kondo himself, do way more than contribute to the overall flight school experience. From the biplane's engine and wheels, and even the rocket belt's engine, to the rather convincing ethereal wind and thermal currents, plus the command prompt cues whenever you're given a specific on-screen instruction to obey. And yet again, don't even fucking get me started with the goddamn accidental collisions that'll in all likelihood occur if you're not paying close motherfucking attention to your techniques or your surroundings either. And before I go any further, take note of my top 10 songs displayed here, with two honorable mentions included, no less. Replayability-wise, considering the game's cultural impact it made ever since its initial debut, both in Japan and the US and Europe later, due to every underlying idiosyncrasy which I've particularized and examined thus far, and which I'm in no position to rehash over and over like a coked-up goddamn drug addict, god forbid, and in spite of all the catastrophic seagull shit you're more than liable to sustain, it's obvious that with an unimaginably prodigious abundance of time, awareness, patience, persistence, effort, and prowess, you'll conquer every challenging event that'll throw your way every chance as it gets. And not to sound too cliche, everything but the motherfucking kitchen sink that is. Granted, Pilot Wings isn't for everyone, as is the case with Super Metroid and Super Godzilla. However, thanks entirely to all the distinctive, accessible flight sim hallmarks and meticulously crafted audiovisual attributes that have been particularized, there's no doubt in one's own subconscious that you'll be soaring endlessly to the unexpected heights of the clear skies thanks to this arduous, aviation-themed 16-bit adventure. And one, might I add, I wouldn't even bother passing up if I were you.
Before I forget, there's only two follow-ups that exist, not counting that potential yet tragically cancelled GameCube update by the once defunct yet recently resurrected German developer Factor 5, known for Turrican and such, Pilot Wings 64 and Pilot Wings Resort, developed for Nintendo by two different companies, the also defunct Paradigm Simulations Care of THQ, based in Farmers Branch, Texas, and Monster Games based in Northfield, Minnesota, which came half a decade following the original on N64 and another decade and a half following the former for the 3DS, respectively, both featuring their own sets of new attributes and improvements in addition to what was introduced from the get-go. Therefore, if you've enjoyed what we've experienced thus far, why not give both of these a jump as well? Henceforth, what's my final verdict? Even now, notwithstanding my rather jaded-ass past, about which I'm sweeping under the fucking rug in favor of my thoughts for this nostalgic flight simulator, I'm in full realization that not everything has to be handed to us in a silver platter, especially in the retro gaming universe. 
Of course, that's where what we've just experienced comes in. Sensitive yet unequivocal controls, and even a nuts and bolts plethora of gameplay cycles for everyone to let sink in, and depth amalgamation with an intense, no fucking around challenging edge, rivaling those of the earlier referenced F-22 Interceptor and LHX Attack Chopper by EA, plus the most mind-blowing audio-visual experience that uncontrollably shits on Atari's Battlezone. But here the fuck I am yet again getting way too goddamn ahead of myself. And by now, I know what everyone's asking. Is it worth anyone's time? <laughs> you bet your ass it is! Not only is it available physically, both loose and or complete in box like the good old days, it's somewhere around 12 to 35 bucks, shit if less, with still newer copies going for 250 big ones, but also on the Wii, Wii U, and 3DS's virtual consoles, and Switch Online for those living in the here and now with a craving for a trip down memory lane, except with an air fuel twist, going for the most reasonable prices. So what the fucking hell are you waiting for? The release of Top Gun 3? Strap your ass in and glide to unparalleled glory with pilot wings, and allow me to assure everyone that there should be no pints of regrets in experiencing everything that it has to offer. Until then, my faithful viewers and listeners, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro God triumphantly signing off.